Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening session. Your moderator, Kilian Karioki. Um, today's session is on simulation for basic sciences. Our presenters are Dr. Wagaki Gishero, uh, anesthesiologist and lecturer at the Kenya Medical Training College, and Dr. Idris Chikope, anesthesiologist and critical care practitioner. Um, kindly ensure your mics are muted and your videos are also turned off. And questions can be posted in the chat box. Uh, we'll read them out later towards the end of the session. The, this CME session is in partnership with Gradient Health Systems. I think uh, we have a good quorum. So Dr. Gishero, if you're ready to start, we can proceed. So thank you very much for all for joining. And it's a pleasure to be here speaking on simulation. Um, we, we will be discussing the use of simulation for basic sciences. And I will start us off with a conversation and then I will hand over to Dr. Idris. All right, so um, a little bit of, about the history of simulation. Um, actually, simulation started a very long time ago with um, uh, Gregor, I think that's the way it's pronounced in Paris, um, determining that there was a need to have an obstetric trainer um, that could enable midwives to uh, deliver infants safely. So him and his son, this was a, a father-son pair, um, had a model that was based on a, on, on a child, that, a dead infant. And, and then they had also uh, a model that was based on um, an obstetric, the womb of a parent, of, of a mother. And so um, they then used that to, in it, to help then the local midwives to train on how to uh, deliver babies. And they actually found that there was a reduction in infant mortality. That is um, around the 1700s. And then in 1960, we had this gentleman called um, Dr. Peter Safar, who was um, yeah, a medical uh, doctor in Baltimore, who uh, wrote a paper and described the use of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to enable somebody to give ventilations in a patient. And then um, a gentleman called Dr. John Lund, um, who had a friend called Lado, who was in the doll making business. He said, he thought maybe we could have a model or a mannequin that could be fashioned uh, by this doll making uh, company that we could use to be able to demonstrate that mouth to mouth ventilation. And so that is how Risasi Ann was was born and that was the beginning point. And so uh, Lado then, you know, had this torso um, um, mannequin that he made that they could then do head tilt chin lift, that they could then uh, demonstrate how to do resuscitation. And then they, uh, and then um, uh, Dr. P uh, Peter Safar asked that perhaps they could put a spring so that then you could do chest compressions. So um, then the mannequin then was used for resuscitation purposes. You could do chest compressions and you could also do ventilations. I think all of us have used the resuscitation. and I think in any ACLS, BLS training, that has been the common uh, mannequin that we have used. There was a neurologist called Dr. Barrows, who, when he was observing neurology uh, patients, as they were being clacked by medical students, he realized that there was, over time, the history would change, and even the symptoms, because the patient got tired of repeating the history and being examined, so you didn't have uh, consistency. So he then thought, why, why can't we train, um, you know, actors to have the same, to, to act the role of patients. And in 1964, then the simulated patient was born. He would train them with neurological symptoms and then they would be used for the purposes of medical education and examining um, 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 medical students. In, uh, in that same uh, uh, decade, the 1960s, towards the end, there was a cardiologist who uh, then uh, uh, came up with this uh, 
the cardiology diagnostic trainer, Harvey, that could then have, you could, students could auscultate and you could then get, um, um, you listen to mamas, you could listen to breaths, breathing sounds, and it was used for diagnostic purposes for cardiac conditions. So you can see there was a lot where people were thinking about how can we uh, have um, simulators or, or mannequins um, that we can be able to use for purposes of clinical training in, in the, uh, for medical education. I think we all perhaps have heard of GABA. He's, he's pretty famous with simulation as well as uh, on uh, uh, anesthesia crisis um, resource management. And, and they wrote a paper in, the, in 1988 where they were describing um, something that they had been doing, they had been trying to figure out, is there a way we could have an environment where anesthesia uh, providers could be trained that's outside of the OR, and that still looks like what they're going, what they're experiencing in the OR, so that they can then be able to uh, have some clinical skills and decision-making skills. And they describe this, what they call the comprehensive anesthesia simulated environment. Uh, and so you can see that here we are moving from uh, a task trainer to uh, a mannequin that can be used for resuscitation. And then we're moving to simulated patients and diagnostic trainers. So um, they then thought, can these be put in an environment? Uh, and they described that environment and they tried as much as possible to have as much as the representation of an anesthesia operating room with patient monitors, uh, a mannequin that could be used and um, uh, so that then they could be able to see how the trainees would respond uh, in that kind of environment. That is similar to what we call now, uh, or that was the beginning point of what we now call a simulation lab or a simulation center where you have an immersive experience that resembles um, uh, a clinical area that the trainee is, is uh, going to work in or has been exposed to in the clinical uh, setting that they're in. Simulation has grown from that point. Uh, there's a lot more technology now that is in use and at present, there's a lot to do with virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. So the virtual reality is where you are, you know, you have these gadgets that you put on and you um, have like a console that you're using. Uh, and you, this, the, the person who's in the virtual reality experiences an, a different environment from the one that they're in based on the fact that they have the gadgets that they have on them. And then they're able to um, uh, perform tasks or, or, or respond in that environment. The augmented reality is where you have uh, an environment that's real. So you're, you're in a real environment, but you still have uh, a gadget that you put some goggles that you put on that overlay uh, a, a digital image on the physical image that you have. So you have a mannequin and you're doing something on the mannequin and the use of the goggles, it overlays an image on the mannequin that you have, and then you respond to that. And then of course you have the mixed one that we've also been seeing a lot of, you know, people doing laparoscopic um, techniques. So you have a mannequin that you're able to, to use um, the, the laparoscopic equipment on, and then it has video cameras, and then it has a digital aspect as well to it. So, um, so that then this, the, 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 the trainee or the person who's experiencing the simulation is able to then uh, respond appropriately uh, in, that, in that situation. So that is the background. And you, as you can see, a lot of it in terms of simulation is based, has been based on clinical skills. And, and it has been used a lot more in, in clinical skills. And today we want to actually discuss whether it is what people are doing now for basic skills and what ways we can think about using it for basic sciences. All right, so I just want to define what simulation is. Um, and Simulation is, is, if I could use this quote, is, is the artificial representation of a complex real world process with sufficient fidel fidelity with an aim to facilitate learning through immersion, reflection, 
feedback and practice minus the risks inherent in a similar real life situation. So it's real life as much as is possible. It's, a, it's an environment where it looks like what you would experience in a clinical setting. So it's, it's very different from when you're doing task training, because in simulation, the, the basic assumption or what is a preparatory phase is that the, the, the trainee or the person going through simulation has to have already had the skills and the knowledge so that they then can apply the, the, the skill and the knowledge in, within the sim, sim, simulation scenario. The other thing that um, one has probably talk about is a fidelity and fidelity simply says that how how real is it how how close are you to what is real um, and, and and so because there's a sense in which the the person going through the simulation or in the simulation scenario has to really be able to envision themselves and therefore respond appropriately. So you don't asking them to suspend disbelief and there are too many elements that are not corresponding to what they're exposed to. And so they, they, you know, they find it difficult to, 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 to act appropriately. Uh, the other thing that what I want to say also about simulation is that it's immersive. So the, 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 the scenarios are created in such a way that the person going through the sim simulation um, can, can envision themselves performing or doing whatever they are doing. So they are in it completely. And, and as they go through the simulation, they're able to make decisions as they would in a clinical situation uh, or in, in whichever uh, scenario it is that you have created. It allows for, for the person going through the simulation also to look back during the debriefing session and think through what they did and what and it allows for them also to, to, to look and see how, how far they are. They are from what is um, practiced, the, the right practice, or the common practice. And then to think through how they will use that in their future, you know, as they go back into clinical situations or scenarios, how will they use the, the, what they have experienced um, based from, from what they have learned through the simulation practice. So when you think about this, then you ask yourself, how are you able to, you're know, doing uh, basic sciences, you know, if you're doing anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology, how, how are you able to represent a real life uh, scenario uh, where the trainee can then be able to envision, um, you know, a cell or, or a, a, a physiological process that is taking place. And I'm happy to say that that will be demonstrated to us by Dr. Idris later. So um, I just want to say uh, again a little bit about what kinds of, uh, when we're thinking about fidelity, what are the options? Uh, sorry, what are the options? So um, there, there is a range from what you call low fidelity simulators, where you have like screen based, where uh, students respond to something, um, um, they, they, they read through uh, a scenario and then they take, you know, respond and they, it follows a certain track and they keep going or uh, they use a mannequin and they, you know, they compress the mannequin if they're doing CPR. So those will be low fidelity mannequins. And you have medium fidelity where you then add on to that some graphical representation, perhaps now that mannequin has a blood pressure uh, the, and, and a screen and you can be able to see that um, perhaps you can be able to um, look at uh, drugs that have been given and see the response when you use those drugs um, on, 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 a, on a monitor. And, and some of these simulators can also be used um, in, in basic sciences. So I just want to show here that you can also have in basic sciences models that you have created that then they can, they can mimic what is going on in a patient's uh, body, even to the level of the tissue level, so that the, the student or the trainee is able to see the effect of what they are doing uh, in, in on physiological processes. And then the last are the high fidelity simulators, which are um, 
I think sometimes beyond most of us because they're very, very, they're, they're, they tend to be expensive. They are not, they're able to do a lot more. They have a lot more um, 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 computer programs that are running them. Um, uh, with, with that are inbuilt within them. And they require a lot more maintenance as well as a steep learning curve in terms of learning how to use them. And um, there's this aspect of, if you're using them like for um, uh, basic sciences, there's, there's what we call the static um, a physiological programming where you have set parameters that uh, that have been set by the person who is operating that that um, the simulator um, and then the operator changes the parameters okay uh, as the, as the trainee or the person going through the simulation makes certain decisions or does certain things and then there are others that are uh, dynamic that are intuitive that there that are inbuilt within the, the simulator that then uh, you, the operator doesn't have to be present. The, the interventions are, in the, uh, are given by the trainee and then there is a response that's generated by the, the, the simulator that is, that is in use. So um, as people have investigated and, and even for us, I think, as we have continued to do a simulation, one of the things that we have found is that it's, it's great for clinical skills. It helps with decision making. It helps with teamwork. Um, it, it's very great for, for adult learners because they're able to reflect on what they are doing and also in, interrogate why they do what they do. Um, and and, and it, it really provides a good environment for learning. But sometimes we have found that the, our presumption that the basic sciences, the basic knowledge is which should be there is not there. And so sometimes you then have to go back to, you know, discuss, you know, basic knowledge that the prerequisite knowledge that should be there. And so we thought it's possible also to use simulation also for basic knowledge. Can we not just wait until students are in clinical years? Can we use it even when they're in their first year or in their second year when they're doing biochem and all those mundane, uh, forgive me, uh, but you know, the, 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 you know the, the content that has got a lot more theory and a, le a lot less lab or, or clinical uh, practice associated. And uh, uh, a lot of medical schools have asked that question and have started to integrate or uh, to have simulation in the, their teaching for basic sciences. And they have found that one of the things that it helps with is to help to integrate um, this way, do I have something? Can I stay muted? All right. Uh, it helps to integrate the basic sciences with the, uh, with the clinical sciences uh, early on in their preclinical years. Uh, and the students then are able to see how their basic sciences are the foundation of what they're going to do in their clinical years usually they would also still have to have had some, uh, some clinical skills training. So they will be doing their basic sciences, but they're also learning how to do uh, patient um, um, history taking, um, interpreting vital signs, physical examination, so that then you can be able to use that. And there are different simulators that have been used for basic sciences. Some are computer assisted, um, the programs where the student would then go through scenarios that are on the computer. And uh, other institutions that have got resources have actually used even high fidelity simulators for pharmacology, for physiology, for anatomy, and uh, even games where they call serious games. So it's not like Monopoly or it is a Monopoly that has got um, something to do with uh, a medical science. And then the student will play those games and they see how the decisions they make, how they work out. Um, I would like to say that it is something that we could think about. And uh, even after we do the demonstration, um, we, we would something that we could then begin to ask ourselves, how can we utilize this? Is it useful? I found that with simulation, there are very few African stories. So I think it also will give us an opportunity to see whether we can generate some stories from Kenya about how we use simulation in different aspects of medical education. 
So I would like to stop there and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Sadisher, for the presentation. Questions can be posted in the chat box if you have any questions regarding simulation. And now we'll be moving to the next um, presenter, Dr. Chikofi. Good evening. I hope you can all hear me. Thank you, Dr. Karyuki, for the introduction. And I'm going to talk about, again, simulation for basic sciences. I'm just going to add on to what um, Dr. Ishiro has talked about. Um, so um, I'd like to make Pabruk and other books visual. Um, maybe I could start with a story. There's a time I was actually formally employed as a teacher. Then I spent the whole night um, doing a PowerPoint. So the lesson was very early in the morning at eight o'clock. So the moment I introduced the subject, the students on the front row all started yawning. So I quit my job because that was good enough feedback. They did not have filled you know, those forms. I also happened to be like a head of department and had access to the feedback forms. And so they said, uh, you know, they were writing about me because I had access and they said, maybe I don't communicate. I don't give notes, I don't communicate. We don't know what that guy is talking about. Could have been many factors. My first language is Swahili. I was in an English speaking region, had those challenges, but then maybe, maybe there was just something wrong with the way I was teaching. So I'm going to do another small introduction and maybe also look at ways in which we can simulate physics and measurements, uh, applied anatomy, applied physiology, because these are the basic sciences uh, for anesthesiologists or any other anesthesia uh, provider. So um, what is simulation? It's already been described, and I'd like to add on to what has already been said, that simulation is, could be mimicry of patients, you know, the disease process, and also their care environments. So you can simulate an emergency room, you can simulate an operating room, you can simulate intensive care, you can simulate level zero care. The objective of which is maybe to bring what you call the medical realism or clinical realism. You know, you just want to mimic um, what a patient would, uh, you know, present with. Um, this may be used for, you know, commonly occurring uh, situations or even for rare disease. I'll show you how to mimic cystic fibrosis if you guys are ready. But it's also important to, you know, in enhancing learning. And I think what has been said is that a lot of the time uh, we enhance the psychomotor aspect. So we end up being robots that when the heart rate is below 60 or below 40 or below a certain cutoff, we just give atropine. So we're just, you know, repeating what someone has told us, but do we know actually what the basis of what you're doing is? And therefore it means we may have to um, not only do the psychomotor, but also enhance the cognitive aspect, which is understanding the first principle, the knowledge, why am I doing this? Yes, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm supposed to increase the heart rate, but you know, why is it low in the first place? Uh, is it just because of one reason or there are many mechanisms of having a low heart rate? So when I started reading Pabruk, it was really difficult. The book is, I think 120 pages and it's black and white. And I could read it maybe three times before I cut and still get 30%. 
So one of the laws they talked about was the Dalton's law of partial pressures. And I think these are very commonly applied law uh, in the operating room. We always mixing gases, blending oxygen and nitrous oxide. Or in the intensive care unit, we are you know, mixing you know, all these gases. So the law states that um, in a mixture of non-reacting gases, uh, if these gases are put in a container, then the pressure exerted on that container is actually the sum total of those individual partial pressures. So uh, partial pressure is actually um, that pressure that a gas would exert on the cylinder wall if it alone occupied that cylinder. And so a very good example is your atmospheric pressure, which has mainly 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. And depending on where you are, you have various um, you know, um, tensions. So for example, when we pre-oxygenate patients, uh, we basically do remove nitrogen and replace it with oxygen. So um, this is an example of how we can do that. So for example, when a patient presents with the OR um, before they are intubated and they're not on any you know, form of oxygen therapy, they're breathing 21%. Uh, my SIM cannot do 21%, but you get the idea. And the nitrogen is 79%. So this is like 0.79 of an atmosphere. When you add the two of them, they give you one atmosphere. So what happens if I, you know, increase uh, the oxygen, I'm trying to push it all the way to, uh, you know, 100%, okay? Uh, at the same time as I do that, then I will have to uh, remove my nitrogen, you know, so when you pre-oxygenate, uh, I'm basically depleting the nitrogen from your FRC. So maybe if this is the way it was taught, maybe I'd have gotten maybe 40% instead of 30, but yeah. So as we say, give oxygen, or as we say, pre-oxygenate, this is the basis for maybe prolonging your apnea time when you sedate and paralyze a patient, and this is a patient with a, a potentially difficult airway, you know, you may want to take a little more time, or you may take a little more time as you try to intubate. Um, so this is the basis for giving oxygen before you intubate, but it's also the same principle for, you know, altering your uh, fraction of inspired oxygen when you're dealing with mechanical ventilators or anesthesia machine. So that is one aspect uh, of basic science, sorry, um, sciences today. Uh, you see here now we can show you anything, including your base of skull. That's where you will con, uh, that's where you will do your infra orbital block. So maybe the student can see this before they go for the practical. You know, I thought this would be useful. Let me go to the next slide. Um, this is my vertebral column. And before I tell you to do a spinal, I just need to tell you that maybe the orientation of your spinous processes are different at different regions of the body. So you take this first year anesthesia resident or first year student from KMTC and you tell him to poke the patient for the first time. Um, I thought this will make the operating room a little less um, unpleasant. Um, maybe this is the reason why if you push the tube a bit deeper, it's likely to go to the right side. Or oh, this is the reason why 
if you have foreign body aspiration, it's likely to go to that side. And also for those of us who may have attempted one lung ventilation, you know, you may actually exclude this upper part of the right uh, lung. Uh, you may wish to intubate and ventilate the whole of this right lung, but the orientation of this first you know, segment uh, you know, may make it uh, a bit difficult to you know, ventilate it. Uh, especially if the tube is a little longer, of course, you may bypass this part and you get right upper uh, lobe uh, collapse. So that's why maybe the use of fiber optic bronchoscopy uh, so that you can also align your Murphy's eye to this part of the, of the right lung. This is the heart and the coronaries. Uh, that's your inferior vena cava. And that's your superior vena cava, and those are your valves. And I can tell you the. This is the LED. You may want to look at the coronaries. You know all that stuff. Uh, so when you tell people that these are posterior MI, you basically know or they understand what it is that is being discussed. Uh, I wasn't so successful here in demonstrating the vocal cords, but those are meant to be the vocal cords. Uh, before you carry the tube, uh, at least you will know what is to be seen. You anticipate what you're gonna see when you do the laryngoscopy. Uh, so you don't tell your students you are looking for two white linear things that are meeting anteriorly and separating wider parts uh, posteriorly. Yeah, so basically that was applied anatomy and we could bring many, many, many more, um, you know, structures. So it's basic sciences. And I thought BH was also basic. But it took many times, you know, many, I read the book many times for me to understand what pH is. So of course, pH has been defined as the acidity or alkalinity of a medium or a solution, you know, it could be your plasma. And the book, the biochemistry book uh, says pH is the, um, the negative logarithm to base 10 of your hydrogen ion concentration. We know that the body works around the clock to just maintain that hydrogen ion concentration within a very narrow range. And you can imagine joining a world round where people are stating, uh, you know, hydrogen ion concentration. Like today, the hydrogen ion concentration was 40 nanometers. Um, Again, 40 nanometer is maybe 40 times 10 raised to the power of negative nine. So that's why they log transformed the pH, you know, so that you can have a number that is easy to talk about or to mention in a word round. So instead of saying the acidity of the body is 40 nanomoles raised to the power of negative nine, we we'll just say the pH is seven uh, uh, point four. So basically, so when your hydrogen ion is 40, you get a pH of four. And they say when your hydrogen ion concentration increases, your pH reduces. So basically, uh, so of course, if the patient became more acidic, they would have low pH. Or if the patient had low hydrogen ion concentration, they'll get a higher pH. So basically, you're just explaining to a first year medical student that yes, the hydrogen ion concentration is inversely related to uh, the pH. We go further ahead and uh, you know, in that Pabrook, they talk about the hydrogen electrode, the oxygen electrode. Um, 
And I think the modern day arterial blood gas analysis does not have an uh, hydrogen electrode. What it does, it actually measures the carbon dioxide tension and also it measures the uh, bicarbonate. I'm not really sure why we don't have the uh, hydrogen ion electrode. Maybe it's too expensive or maybe calibration is difficult. So what it does, it actually puts the henderson hassel bulk equation into use. So the henderson hassel bulk equation says that pH can actually be derived uh, from your pKa and the ratio of your bicarbonate to carbon dioxide. So um, in this uh, model, your bicarbonate of course represents your metabolic component and your carbon dioxide represents your respiratory component. But you know, carbon dioxide is a gas. Uh, so this gas of course has to be hydrated in the presence of carbonic anhydrase. Um, so it gets to dissolve. And for you to, you know, dissolve carbon dioxide, then you have to use the solubility coefficient. This is what we call this Oswald solubility coefficient uh, for you to be able to produce your bicarb uh, carbonic acid. The weak carbonic acid will dissociate into your bicarbonate and the hydrogen ion. And the pH at which these are in equilibrium is your pKa, which is uh, maybe 6.1 for the bicarbonate, carbon dioxide acid base conjugate. We're using this because this is the most abundant uh, maybe buffer and contributes maybe to nearly 70% of your total buffering capacity. Um, there may be many methods of uh, assessing blood gas analysis. Uh, this method is called the Boston method. However, there's another one called the Copenhagen method. There's controversy across the Atlantic, but the best on Boston method is this one, which is very easy to understand and very uh, widely accepted. So I think at the end of the day, uh, the pKa is constant, the 0 0.03 is constant. And I think the most important thing is the ratio between your bicarbonate and your carbon dioxide, such that, uh, you know, uh, I think in uh, normal physiology, uh, the bicarbonate ranges from 22 to 26. So we'll use the median number of 24. And of course your carbon dioxide, when you're breathing adequately, that in terms of depth and rate of respiration, you are expected to make a median of 40 millimeters of mercury and if you do that, it gives you a pH of 7.4. So that is when the patient is just metabolically doing okay. And also uh, in terms of respiratory. So when you have respiratory acidosis, for example, it is assumed that the metabolic component remains constant or remains unchanged, but the respiratory beat goes up. So let's say a patient has been given morphine and is not breathing as deeply and the CO2 goes up, uh, so your pH comes down. Or if the patient now is excited about his TikTok account, uh, they hyperventilate and the pH goes up. Or if the meta respiratory component is constant, but now the patient has DKA and the bicarbonate is really low, you know, uh, and I think for those of us working in public hospitals, uh, a pH of 6.8 is not an uncommon sight. Uh, the kids that come to the public ICUs, uh, the difficult IV access, gastroenteritis, pH of 6.9 is not an uncommon uh, sight. But you know, for example, in this situation, uh, what would one do, of course, the first thing one will do is to give bicarbonate, uh, you know, uh, so maybe they increase the bicarbonate to 20, you know, of course you'll have uh, a fairly good gas, but you know, this is temporary. If the patient came with a bicarbonate of four, you probably need a, what, uh, 
maybe like a PC or two or 15, you know, so like this is a patient who must hyperventilate just to maintain uh, the ratio between your CO2 and your, you know, bicarbonate. So for example, these are patients who had a hypertrophic uh, stenosis and they were in severe metabolic uh, uh, alkalosis. And, you know, sometimes uh, if you're not happy with the gas that you're seeing, you may just want to confirm using the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. So uh, this is in kilopascals. This, I had never seen such a gas and I was really doubting, is it a true gas? So I just subject it to this equation. So um, your PCO2 is a uh, 3.5 kilopascals. If you multiply that by 7.5, what will that be? Um, 3.5 and 7.5 is 20 what? 26.25. Uh, sorry, this is the wrong place. Uh, this is carbon dioxide. So you say it's 28, you say 26.25. And the patient was making up a carbonate of 20, 28.5. So if I do that, yes, I know the pH is actually, this is a true gas, you know, sometimes you may not trust your lab. And this is actually what they do when they're doing the quality control. They have a solution that is for acidosis. They have a solution that is for alkalosis. And they have a solution that is just for uh, normal acid base, uh, you know, balance. Yeah, so the next thing is actually uh, trying to explain the difference between a regular biphasic ventilation and APRV. Uh, APRV is, uh, is unconventional, uh, biphasic is conventional. But then again, just me with my Swahili orientation trying to explain something in English, it's also difficult. So sometimes I draw, but then I know, like I could now actually demonstrate. So for example, what is the mean air pressure? Because the only difference between regular biphasic and APRV is your mean air pressure, uh, which of course is a result of the difference in your breath timing. So in conventional biphasic ventilation, you have your inspiratory time uh, being shorter than your expiratory time. A lot of the time when you put patients on the mechanical ventilator and they don't have lung problems, we normally set the inspiratory time to be half the expiratory time or the expiratory time to be twice the inspiratory time. And you can see here, for example, the eye time in um, regular, uh, you, know, you know, conventional ventilation is 1.4 seconds and the expiratory time is 2.4 seconds, giving you a total cycling time of maybe 4.2 seconds, which may, you know, translate to 14 breaths per second. And you have your PEEP, PEEP is your lowest pressure. And then you have your inspiratory pressure, which is the pressure realized um, at the end of your inspiration. So I will tell them that maybe by physic, you have your breathing at two levels, but when you move from one level to the higher level, you inflate the lung. And of course, at the end of your inspiratory time, you deflate the lung. And so there's gonna be air movement. But I think at the end of the day, if you get a patient with maybe refractory hypoxemia, you have already given them 100% oxygen and they're not improving. So the only other thing is to actually improve their mean air pressure. So the mean air pressure is the time weighted average in your air pressure uh, throughout your ventilatory cycle. So it shouldn't be that a, a patient is just benefiting during the inspiratory phase and losing the benefits during the expiratory phase, you need a time-weighted average in area pressure. So in regular biphasic, uh, uh, so if you set maybe the inspiratory pressure at 25, and then you set maybe the inspiratory time at 
and then you set up people five, and then maybe you do an expiratory time, uh, you know, of 2.8, your mean air pressure is around 12 centimeters. Old. But what happens by level is that, uh, sorry, in APR, we, we may have the same peak pressure, but you sustain it for a longer period than you would in regular uh, biphasic. And also you truncate your expiratory time because a lot of the time is spent on inspiration. Uh, this is a very stiff lung. Of course, you know, when you're blowing into a balloon that is stiff, you need to spend a lot of time blowing it in. So that now we change the inspiratory time. So like in APRV, we'd like to do the inverse. It's some sort of inverse ventilation, inverse ratio ventilation, where the inspiratory time is like nine times the expiratory time. And it's a lower mode of ventilation. So for example, if I set an inspiratory time of 3.6 seconds, uh, we try to eliminate the PEEP here. Uh, and maybe we set a very short expiratory time of like 0 0.4 seconds. Uh, yes. So you find that at the same peak pressure, you have a higher mean air pressure compared to regular biphasic ventilation, where at the same peak, you have a mean air pressure that is almost half what you'll get uh, when you perform uh, APRV. And that's why APRV, for example, may be very useful in patients who have refractory uh, hypoxemia because you inflate the lung, you sustain the lung in inspiration, and you're able to recruit a bit you know, many more um, alveoli. I don't know if this basic sense, but uh, yes, it's part of the discussion. And last, I'm going to demonstrate venous return. So um, at the end of the day, rather not just venous return, but I think we always, uh, talk about the forward flow when it comes to hemodynamics, but also the backward flow is very important because the equilibrium, the point at which your venous return is equal to your cardiac output, uh, that may be your central venous pressure. So uh, the Frank Sterling curve is the one um, in black, and it states that as your venous return increases, you get an increase in your stroke volume until a point where additional you know, venous return may not give you any benefits, right? Um, the venous return curve, uh, which is also called the Gaton curve, is the one in red, uh, that for you to have good cardiac output, then you must have good enough venous return. But the same, same force from the left ventricle during maybe ejection is not the same same force that returns the blood back to the heart. There has to be another method because once you get to the, you know, arterioles and the capillaries, uh, I think that force is dissipated over a very big surface area and it loses its ability to pump uh, the blood back to the heart. Again, when you give a vasoconstrictor like maybe norepinephrine, for example, uh, we're happy that the mean arterial pressure has gone up due to maybe vaso or arterial cons cons uh, constriction. But then if a patient has distributive shock, uh, you know the patient has not lost any volume. They just have the same amount of volume, but just in a bigger container. So, if you give neuropathy, you're not just causing arteriolar constriction, but you're also causing venous constriction. And the addition of neuropathy may in itself augment venous return. So on this y, x axis, we have um, the right atrial pressure. So um, especially when you're doing spontaneous breathing, the right atrial pressure goes down because the patient generates a negative intrathoracic pressure and the, the lung or the chest cavity being an enclosed cavity. So anything that happens in the lung could easily be transmitted into the 
cardiac chambers. So when you take a deep breath, of course, your pressure becomes negative. And you know, fluids, uh, blood is fluid and it moves from a region of a higher pressure, you know, in the systemic veins to a region of lower pressure uh, in the, you know, um, atria. So basically, when you give uh, norepi, you are probably, you are probably, you know, increasing the pressure in the veins. So you're increasing the gradient uh, between the pressure in the peripheral veins and the pressure in the heart. So by just giving norepi, you may actually be augmenting venous return. So for example, if I push norepi, I'll be moving my, you know, uh, uh, venous constriction. And so you can see the mean uh, filling pressure has moved maybe from four to eight, and this augments your venous return. And when your venous return goes up, your forward flow also goes up. Or let's say I give a, you know, a vasodilator, for example. So when I give a vasodilator, the mean systolic filling pressure in the veins actually goes down. And so the venous return reduces and your cardiac output may reduce. So at the end of the day, you know very well that you may give patient plenty of fluids, but if the venous tone is not augmented early, uh, you may not get good enough results. Um, so just playing your, with your main systemic feeling pressure, uh, you are in increasing your venous return uh, and the point of intersection between your venous return curve and your forward flow curve actually increases. We know cardiac output is a function of heart rate and the stroke volume. Of course, uh, if I reduce the heart rate, you can see my cardiac output is coming down. The point at which the two intersect uh, is low. Uh, of course, if I increase the heart rate up to a certain point, uh, my cardiac output improves. Um, and we're hoping that the forward flow is equal to the back uh, or the venous return. So I think I've finished my presentation. Uh, I'd like to urge us all to be future ready. Yeah, that's the end. Thank you very much. I hope there are no questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Chikofe, for a wonderful presentation. There'll definitely be some questions. Um, but first, we'll start, we'll move to our partner in this CME, uh, Gradian Health Systems. We'll give them an opportunity to give us a short presentation. Good evening, all. Uh, my name is uh, Anthony Gedenji. I'm representing uh, Gradian Health Systems, who has partnered with KSA uh, for this uh, hybrid webinar. And uh, we are glad to have all of you attendees. I can see we are above 140. And uh, who is Gradient Health Systems? Gradient Health Systems is a non-profit medical technology company based uh, in New York with offices in Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, and Tanzania. And we work uh, mainly in uh, safe surgery, critical care, and anesthesia. Those are our main areas. Um, our model mainly is um, uh, we have three pillars, that is technology, training, and customer support. So we are funded mainly by a philanthropist who is Nick Simmons Foundation, and that is what has enabled us, in, uh, including the sales that we do. We do sell equipment. And the only equipment we sell are anesthesia machines. You can be able to see the, the banners around the room and critical care uh, ventilators. Um, we are pleased to be partners with you. We partner with several um, academic institutions across the globe. We're currently in 35 countries. We currently have an installation base of over a thousand medical devices that only includes anesthesia and uh, ventilators. And we partner with uh, doctors like Dr. Geshero, Dr. Idris, and I think several of you who are online to be our cl cl clinical trainers. 
We also do biomedical engineering training because we believe uh, information is power. And uh, to have our equipment out there, we need support. So we cannot be in all those countries where we have our equipment. So we work through several partners also. Um, it's our pleasure. I was told I'll invite people to dinner. I don't know if it's time to invite people to dinner. Uh, Dr. Agaki, or that will come later. I think we'll, we'll first have After a Q&A session. Thank you. Um, so that is just who Gradient Health Systems is uh, partnering with KSA. And we have had previous partnerships and we shall continue partnering also with the KSA and the Critical Care Society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move to the Q&A session. Um, the first question, I think, is for Dr. Gishero. Regarding a simulation, a simulation allows one to train in a risk-free environment, but the scenarios we have um, in the theater and ICU are fraught with risk. How do we measure the effectiveness of simulation training for our personnel? the anesthesia personnel. All right, thank you for that question. Um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, maybe, maybe, let me start with the, the last aspect of that. How do we see whether our simulations are having effect? There's actually something called simulation-based research. And people have uh, actually published a lot of papers where they have uh, done uh, randomized, randomized uh, studies um, where they have looked at different groups and or controlled studies as well. So they have a group that has not done simulation and a group that has, and then they uh, assess them before the simulation in terms of their basic knowledge is the same. And then they, they take one group through simulation and then another they don't. And then they then assess to see um, one who goes to like, like the, to the clinical area or they whatever learning medium that they usually do, they would go through that. But one group has in addition to that simulation. And they found that many of the times they found that learning outcomes are the same. However, they found that the retention, um, it may be months later, was higher in the group that does simulation. And I think looking at what uh, Dr. Idris has demonstrated, you can see why. Because when you do simulation, you're not just, it's not just paper-based and lecture-based where you're listening to the teacher saying something. Um, it is the fact that you're able to um, put yourself in that situation, see what you do and see the response that it is, it produces when you make an intervention. And then that it becomes ingrained in your mind and you can play it back in, in, in your mind. And it helps you then also to reflect on your practice and then make changes if there's, there's need to make changes. So there's a consolidation that takes place uh, when you go through simulation. So there's, there's that aspect that there is simulation-based research. And as I had said earlier, that there's an opportunity for us to do uh, researches on that. You know, we do use simulation at different levels. Sometimes we CPR, um, different aspects that we, we use them for. And the question is, is it, does it have an effect on our medical education? Does it change anything? And um, can we believe what others have published? Can we publish as well and see what our stories are? Um, the other aspect of um, it being uh, a simulation that allows us to train in a risk-free environment, but the scenarios are fought with risk. Um, the, the, it, it's, it's an interesting question because simulation requires that whoever is um, creating the scenarios thinks carefully of what they want to simulate. And it allows that you can break down process, you can break down processes into small chunks um, so that you're looking more at the process, maybe not so much at the end, at the, at the product. You know, when we sometimes we do simulations, you know, if you make a mistake, the patient dies. So that's the end result. But many times you're thinking that's not really where you're going with it. It's a process. It's how, how did you move from point A to point B? What were you thinking? What informed your decisions? What resources did you utilize? So it helps that you can be able to go through the process of whatever scenario that, that has been created. So perhaps maybe um, we can uh, look at the way we create the scenarios so that they are not 
wrought with the risk in terms of um, risk to the person going through the scenario. Uh, uh, and and uh, so that they are not having harm <laughs> based on the way we're doing the scenario. But if they're well created, they should be able to um, take the learner through a process where they're able to actually interrogate their practice. So I hope I have answered the question in terms of understood it well enough to answer it. Uh, but if I haven't, Dr. Biwot, feel free to um, rephrase, uh, ask again. Thank you. was quite a um, response to that question. The next question is for Dr. Chikope. What application did you use to make such a nice, such nice 3D diagrams? Very interesting for Friday afternoon classes when students see on. The application is called Mathematics. Um, it's actually the most important thing is learning how to make it work like that. It's not even just knowing what it is. It's how to make it produce those things. That's the hardest part. Yeah. Mathematical. The next is a comment. Um, I think um, it's uploading the use of simulation reducing learning and um, what the zero reference is. It's a great work and presentation. I think there are several comments that are uploading the presentation and the work that is done. And um, also, also a point in terms of the ancient Indian practices where the initial was the practical sessions first, followed by theory and a comment regarding the pH. And uh, the presentation of pH was quite good. So it also reflects that the changes may seem small, but on a logarithmic scale, the changes actually on the homeostasis are quite, quite significant. Uh, the next two questions are for gradient. I don't know if I can get them to give us an answer. Uh, the first question is, will the gradient help us set up for Canexa? That's a college of anesthetists of Eastern and Southern Africa. And do you have an outlet in Zambia? So that's for Anton. I'm sorry, I didn't get the first question, but on the second question, yes, we do have a partner in Zambia. It is called Sonagy Diagnostics. Um, they are the partners that we work through. And we've done, um, I think, two major programs in Zambia with uh, them with, and with JICA also. The first question, uh, I'm sorry, maybe unless you repeat it, I didn't get it. Um, the first question is, you, will Gradient help us set up for, it's, it's um, what do you call, postgraduate anesthesia program under the College of Anesthetics of Eastern and Southern Africa. I think that can be discussed. <laughs> Um, yes, we'd be, we'd be happy to see how we can uh, partner and support. Uh, maybe you can talk to Dr. Agaki and Dr. Idris to give you our contacts. And because um, that's what we do, we would be proud to partner and support and see how we can support. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We've gone through all the questions and comments. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Hopefully we will hear of more simulation experiences in the future from Kenya and the region. Um, thank KSA, the webinar organizing team and all participants. Thank you to our presenters, Dr. Kisheru and Dr. Idris. And thank you to Gradient for partnering with us. Um, the CME will be uploaded to the KSA website and the, and the other platforms. CPD points will be availed through email and certificates. Um, we have our conference this year um, in Shanzu, uh, 13th to 15th July. Um, registration is ongoing and you can access the KSA website um, to get more information. 
thank you for attending the CME and uh, and have a wonderful evening. The physical participants, I think Anthony will welcome you for, for dinner. Thank you. Oh. Um, sorry, um, yes, for those of us who are here physically, uh, including the crew, you're most welcome for dinner. Uh, we'll be told by uh, uh, Shelmith where it will be served. Karibu sana, and thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. One important component of emergency care is automatic ventilation, which keeps critically ill patients breathing long enough to reach the care they need. But reliable ventilators are... In Sub-Saharan Africa, an estimated 300 million people live at least two hours from emergency care. When healthcare is so far away, a traffic accident, complicated birth, or other emergency can lead to a preventable death or disability. One important component of emergency care is automatic ventilation, which keeps critically ill patients breathing long enough to reach the care they need. But reliable ventilators are hard to come by in many parts of the world. Having a bed without a ventilator, not only cannot manage... In Sub-Saharan Africa, an estimated 300 million people live at least two hours from emergency care. When healthcare is so far away, a traffic accident, complicated birth, or other emergency can lead to a preventable death or disability. One important component of emergency care is automatic ventilation, which keeps critically ill patients 
breathing long enough to reach the care they need. But reliable ventilators are hard to come by in many parts of the world. Having a bed without a ventilator, not only cannot manage our patients in the way we want, our ICU is not recognized because of having less ventilators. Before, we were not able to transfer patients with ventilation, so we used manual bamboo bags to ventilate the patients. Introducing the Gradient CCD, an internationally certified portable ventilator. built to thrive in low resource settings with 21 hours of battery power connections to multiple oxygen sources an inbuilt air compressor and a detachable rolling cart the ccd is an ideal ventilation solution for any hospital seeing someone who was having difficulty in breathing tied with asthma saturations were quite low despite every effort intubated on ccd it was incredible. So you can use it in the, for transportation, but also for treating the patients in ICU. We usually call it portable vent. Other than better, they have a specific type of patient. But this one can be used both in the pediatric and in the other patients. The CCV has a straightforward interface and custom modes that make it easy to operate for all users. It's a simple one to use. Alongside every CCV installation, Gradient provides in-depth clinical training for all new users. They've been continuously supporting us, uh, continuously educating us on how to use it. And all CCVs are supported with Gradient's three years service warranty, covering maintenance, parts and repairs. Our goal is to make it easier for health providers to deliver life-preserving care. With the Gradient CCV, they can do just that. It simplifies my work and I'm much comfortable and confident Le vaporisateur de votre UAM doit parfois être remplacé, par exemple.